Hello, and um, thanks for joining us for this Filmfest DC conversation with Claudia Sparrow, director, producer of the um, inspiring documentary Maxima, which is in our Justice Matters section. I'm Linda Blackaby, senior program consultant and Justice Matters curator for Filmfest DC. I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral and sacred land of the Ramatush and Ohlone and pay my respects to the elders and to the contemporary water and land defenders. Today in San Francisco, I'm reflecting on the state sanctioned genocide of indigenous people during the 19th century California gold rush and their continued resistance. In the real world, we would have all gathered together in the cinema to watch Maxim and talk afterwards with Claudia. This is not that, but we're really pleased to have her with us virtually. Born and raised in Peru, Claudia has been recognized by Peruvian media as one of the 10 prominent filmmakers in Peru. She previously directed the romantic feature film, I Remember You, released theatrically in 2016. She's a recipient of the Franklin J. Schaffner Fellow Award for directing El Americano, which won an Emmy. And she is a 2018 Film Independent Fellow and a 2017 Sundance alumna. Maxima is her first documentary though, so welcome, Claudia. Thank you, Linda. Um, it's a pleasure. I'm so glad that we are able to share Maxima with the best audience. Oh, we're happy too. Thank you. I, I just wanted to start with how did you learn about Maxima's story? Why did it draw you away from making narrative films? And how did you adapt to documentary production? Yes, yeah, so ironically, um, if you had asked me Four years ago, if I would if, if I would ever <laughs> make a documentary, I would have told you absolutely not. It was just not my focus. I love documentaries, but again, I was just really been working on, on on fiction. That was my interest all along. So that all changed the minute I came across the story of Maxima Cunha back in 2016. Um, I'm Peruvian. I had been living here in the U.S. for many years, and I came across her uh, an article that a Peruvian journalist had written about her story right after she had won the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2016. And I was so moved, inspired by her. I was just so taken by her story that I, I literally couldn't stop thinking about her. Yeah. And I'm a Peruvian filmmaker. I, I just felt like I had to do whatever I could to help give her voice a larger platform. And basically that's where it all started. And, you know, it, it wasn't meant to be, uh, I guess, at the beginning of a feature film. It was more, I thought, you know, maybe I can make a short about her story, um, you know, any, anything, something. Um, so that basically, but that is how I got to, to her and how I was. <laughs> but when you, how were you able to connect to her and uh, what were the challenges and how did you gain the trust of her and her family? Right. Uh, very, very important question. So obviously because her fight, you know, again, I, I heard of her in 2016, but she had been fighting since 2011. So obviously, um, a, a, you know, a lot of people, she, the, she already had been, um, a lot had been going on legally and a lot of mm -hmm. NGOs were already involved with her. Some people not with their best intentions had also reached to her. So when I, my first contact was her lawyer, um, Mirta Vasquez in Peru, oh, she's, she's great. lawyer, she's in the film. So I reached out to her and, you know, you, you have to take into account, we also, you, you see it in the film, but they are so underfunded that, you know, have so few resources and so many cases, um, and, you um, know, they're fighting the largest corporations in the world. So just to get a hold of Mirta, and I'm like, nobody trying to reach, you know, Mirta who is like so busy. It, it took a really long time um, because she also not only just is a lawyer, she's also a, a teacher at the national school, at the university, sorry. She's also a full-time mother. Uh, sorry, she's a mom also. So, so she's just really busy. And so it took months until we could connect and then I could uh, tell her about myself, what I, you know, that I wanted to help. And it started from there. She then obviously had to also go and ask the family and make sure that I, they would be comfortable meeting me. And so eventually, we, I think we started talking in April and I only got to finally travel and meet the family in September that year. Wow. So it was yeah. a lot of, of back and forth. Um, and then with the family, obviously, it, it took also time to get comfortable 
so that they will like feel comfortable with us, with me, with my team. Could you talk a little bit about building, um, I guess what makes the film this so, so dramatic, uh, the contrasting um, scenes of the landscape and of the mine, uh, the cinematography, the, 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 the lakes, and also the sound and the music. I love Maxima's uh, soft speaking voice and her singing. Yes, so, you know, Maxima is, is, is just such a, um, she's a star. I mean, it's probably the wrong way to describe her because she's, she's a lot more than that, but she, she's just so incredibly charismatic that she just, just by being herself, like she's so engaging. So she has this quality of her that even myself, when I first heard her story, I look her online, some interviews of her, her singing, because she had won the Woman of Mental Prize where she sang as a thank yeah. you. So I, I was again, so taken by her and we wanted to make sure obviously in telling her story, in, in portraying who she is and, and how she, you know, her lifestyle and how she deals with her emotions and, and you know, my understanding of the challenges is by singing. And, and sometimes also the, the, you know, her happy, happy times as well. So all of the, her chanting is improvised. So she normally will sing and she just reflects on how she's feeling at that particular time. And so we make sure that when we were recording sorry, we're shooting, um, but, you know, that we also capture that. Her surroundings that you've seen are, you know, outstanding. The, the nature around in, in the area yeah. is just, you know, so beautiful and outstanding, like, like a, a breathtaking. So again, we, we didn't have to do much. We, we just have to document, you know, that the, the land, the landscape. And, and regarding the music, I work with uh, Mauricio Yesigi. He's a phenomenal composer. Um, and, you know, we also made sure that we, our approach was to use um, instruments that were native to the area or not native, but um, that were like used in Andean music, but that we also transform them to give them a, a specific sound because to represent Maxima, she's such a unique, woman that we also wanted to make sure that the sounds that we created we, were also un unique to her uh to her fight so that, that's so that was basically our approach so you may not hear it super clearly but we are literally using air we're using water we, we just um it was just processed to sound differently mm -hmm. yeah it's beautiful uh, okay. could you could you talk a little bit about uh how the film fills in the back story of Maxima, the things that happened before the relationship of the Camarga uh, community to the mines and corporations. You include the mercury spill that happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it has to do with how did you how do how do you fit it in so so well, and where did you find that footage? You know, one of the things to me that I, I was shocked to discover when I first started looking, like putting looking back, right, uh, you know, the backstory, and not, not just Maxima, of the, the company itself, I was shocked that all these incidents had already, you know, similar incidents had been happening for 15 years at the time. Um, so, and, and, you know, that had come out, like, you know, they obviously had been, you know, events that were, in, at least in Peru, they, they had been covered in the media, the Mercury spill was a huge incident where, you know, you, you had their, um, we, again, we see it in the film, but they send their vice president from the U.S. to the area to um, to look at to look at the incidents. There were press conference, so, so the material, ironically, was out there. It's just that um, it, it clearly it, it was not something like mainstream media had focused on or or, or given enough attention, really. So um, we started, you know, again, there was some material available there. They, we also, once we started um, working with Maxima, we started engaging with the community, with other local activists who themselves had also been, you know, they, thankfully they had cell phones or, or access to cameras. So over the past few years, they had also been recording um, any incident or anything that they, they thought would be, uh, you know, useful to record. And then obviously there, there were also NGOs that had been working with the family that also um, had been 
even before Maxima, they had been involved with the communities. So they also had been able to record, uh, again, incidents. So we, we started building that. There was also material we got from journalists. So we, you know, we, we were lucky that, but, but also, again, I, you know, it, it was kind of, to me, shocking that, oh my God, this, this was already, like, it's nothing new, really. It's just that nobody's talking about it. And why do you think that is, that nobody was, was talking about it? Um, the power of the Newmont Corporation? Um, yes, so- The world, uh, yeah. All these uh, powerful players allied against them. Exactly, and, and you know, this is specifically, because we, we really focus on Maxima's case, I can only speak to specifically what we saw had been dynamic with this corporation, Newmont Mining Corporation. And is you know, obviously, this is an incredibly powerful company and they seem to really care and invest financially on their image. Obviously, they, they need to, you, know, you go to their website and you know, they, are, they clearly you know, list there like that they, are, um, that, they, that they are environmentally conscious, that they really care about local communities, that they work in conjunction with them, that they get their permission for projects, um, that basically they are operating in a sustainable way. So that obviously is very important. They, they have to present that image. They, they, they need that, to, they need to report that to their investors. Um, you know, and clearly our experience um, was the opposite. In Peru, sadly, also, um, you know, we, we have had a lot of corruption, but also the mentality that um, along the lines of uh, new, uh, neo liberalism, like it's, quick money is best for society. Um, you know, because we are a developing country, you know, we just have to invest in businesses that are gonna give us a lot of money in return quickly. And so we've been told that mining is, we, we depend on mining to, to survive, that the Peru cannot do without mining and that all the damage, first of all, they don't even wanna list the damage, but that is, you know, worth whatever it takes. And, you know, it's, Unfortunately, you, you have these situations where um, mine, mine, work, mine workers or, um, <coughs> excuse me, high executives from the mines will go and work for the country. So they'll become um, ministers of the, not, not necessarily the environment, but you know, ministers of uh, mining. So of course they go on approved projects that are going to benefit mining companies and then vice versa so that happens a lot they then go back work for mine then they go back work for the government so they they are just there's this systematic um uh, in, you know in a way corrupted system where they are just benefiting each other benefiting financial um benefiting the economy but not really actually but at the expense of the environment at the expense of uh, of the people. So again, it's, this is in Peru is, is what happens, unfortunately. It's a cycle. Uh, Newmont is the, um, now I think you see in the movie, the largest yeah. gold mining company in the world, yes. or mining in general, yes. Yeah, in 2019, they became the, the largest gold producer in the world. Uh -huh. It's amazing. And how do they make best profits then from the gold? There's a lot of heavy equipment, there's a lot of work, um, is it, and, and yet the people in the community are very poor. Right. Um, how does that work? So what we were, what we, I guess, learned by interviewing um, former employees and just talking to the community um, is that they, you know, there's a lot of exploitation happening, at least for the workers at the actual mine, at the actual site. So what would happen is that they are uh, overworked. They don't, they basically are forced to work almost 24 hours uh, every day of the, uh, of the year, no holidays. They are be, they're actually being recorded. So, um, uh, sorry, maybe not necessarily recorded, but they, 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 in this specific case, the track that they use the, the tracks to uh, remove the land, um, they, have, um, uh, they have a way of tracking the activity. So if they stop, um, they are questioned, like, why are you taking a break? Why aren't you just going, going, going? And what no, nobody tells them is the potential um, health 
um, how, how, how their work can potentially add, add a, affect their health because obviously they are, they're heavy metals they're working with. Nobody tells them that. So again, this is, there is a systematic approach in which they are um, misinformed. And then when they start getting sick, they don't take responsibility. They start eventually, as they get sicker, they start sending them to different positions that are like really, in a way, boring within the, the mindset, in, in the mind, um, the mindset. Um, and basically, you know, over time, in a way, they are forced to quit, to leave, and they leave without compensation, and they leave when they are very sick, sometimes disabled. So there, and you know, that is on one side how they at least handle operations on site. But then there is also they they get away without. Um, really meeting uh, environmental safety guidelines again mm -hmm. because they have the support of the government so they um, they are making everything easier for them so that they don't have to pay more for their operations to make it sustainable because they, they, they don't have to they can get away with mm -hmm. a lot less so that saves them costs um, and, and you know again this is um, obviously the Peruvian government also has a role and a lot of responsibility because they are allowing this to happen um, that said, um, our understanding is that Newmont here in the US also knows that that's happening. They are also taking advantage of a corrupted, underdeveloped, uh, you know, country and, and, and its government. So, um, you know, they, they ultimately have the power to do that. And, you know, to me, what is the most upsetting is that they have money. They have the money to do this well, to do operations at least better. In, in a way that their employees are compensated, that they are actually given the healthcare that they need, that they are operating as sustainable as it possibly can be. Um, all, the, all these things that, um, that they are, and, and actually um, helping the community in meaningful ways, all these things that they are not really doing, even though they, they claim they do. And is uh, how how is it that they can engage the national police to, you know, go and dig up the crops and all of that? Yes, um, so that uh, that also um, has been a big a big issue. So the 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 government does allow that companies can hire policemen on their free time to work privately for companies. The problem here is, as you can see in the video, they are not acting as private security. They are working for the mine as policemen. So they are dressed with police uniforms. They are using the police weapons. And so it's insane because police are <laughs> there, obviously, to protect citizens. So when you run in the situation where you have man, uh, maxima uh, against you know, facing or encountering the mine engineers and you have the police there, you just don't know, are they there to protect Maxima or are they there to arrest her and be standing in favor of the mine? So that is something that right now, actually, uh, Maxima's lawyers in Peru are, are working to, to have a reset because they, they really want the government to look seriously at, at that law because it's not in compliance. The, you know, the mine in this case clearly is not using the right, um, it's not using that law rightfully and, and that's been a, a huge problem is um this legal industrial gold mining is obviously incredibly dirty as is you know oil in other countries and other u.s uh corporate involvement um is there any way you think it can be tackled and is there any way of mining gold that's not inherently poisonous Right. So in this case, again, we, we focus specifically on the, the Yanacocha mine. Uh, when talking and interviewing to uh, interviewing experts, uh, there, there was a, a lot that came out of it, at, at least to me. And, you know, there is not an obvious solution because we, we do depend on metals, uh, you know, as a society in, in many ways there. But there is a way to do things better. So one of the takeaways, for example, or one of the, the highlights of the conversations I had was that the, the environmental, the former um, minister of the environment in Peru, he told me, you know, everything is possible, but, uh, but at a cost. So that goes for the company, you know, they can probably find a more, a much more sustainable way of extracting gold, but it will cost them maybe 
twice or three times as much as it costs them to operate now. So, you know, th that is a decision they have to make. Like, okay, are we gonna, are we gonna commit to doing that, to doing this? And then on the other hand, you have the argument of, um, once you extract the mineral from the land, it's gone forever, like forever. So now you have contaminated soil, you have contaminated water and contaminated air forever. So then you really have to balance out, okay, you know, we are extracting metals that we are using, but we are losing this precious resource forever. So as a society, do we, do we want to do that? You know, is it really worth it? So, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I'm inclined to think that, um, you know, unfortunately is, is not. And we really, really, really have to work hard at finding alternatives. Um, I think yeah. that there is, um, you know, there is already an effort in that direction, um, but, you know, which I'm excited about. And, and then, you know, when it comes to gold specifically, there are also ways to um, work with gold more sustainably, at least there's already a lot of, wool, of gold out in the world. So, you know, you can use recycled gold um, and hopefully find alternatives for, for other uses. But, um, but yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it, it is what it is, uh, unfortunately, in the sense of it's once you extract it, it's, it's not going to grow back. It's not on that, on that extent, it's not really sustainable. There's a lot more to talk about in terms of the World Bank and its International Finance Corporation, but in, instead I wanted to go back a little bit to, to Maxima herself and uh, this legal battle that's been going on for many years. Um, I, I wonder what recourse she would have had, had, had if Earth Justice International hadn't stepped in to help her, one, and, and two, can you update us on where this incredibly long struggle is now, since the end of the film, since what we saw at the film. Sure. So uh, my understanding is that you know in Peru, the and, and Mirta I think explains it also in the film, but she says that Peru doesn't allow you to basically build a case that is specifically about human rights violations that you know that that, that have happened, for example, in in the case of of Maxima. So they they would have had to limit themselves to build a case for every uh, specific um, harassment or abuse. Like it would have to have in one case individually, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that makes everything more complicated. And also, and, and also um, it doesn't really address the the issue of human rights, like all the, the all the violations that she has been experiencing. So I think that if Airways International hadn't stepped in, it would have not, you know, Maxima wouldn't have been able to uh, get justice on that end. And most importantly, because the case was brought in the US, I think that, you know, the, the, the company suddenly realized, oh, okay, like the US is now watching, the US is now hearing about this. If, if they were to live in Peru, Again, we, we unfortunately have a government that favors uh, corporations um, and uh, especially international corporations. So it would have been a lot easier for these to not get any justice at all. And, and, oh, and, and then the, to answer your question on what is happening in the legal fight ongoing, <laughs> unfortunately. So, you know, in the film, you see that um, Maxima's, um, Maxima basically uh, loses in the PA in the court in Pennsylvania and they appeal and that that's what, what, where, we, where we left it at so that appeal was rejected recently uh, on the arguments that there is not as, enough proof that the Peruvian courts are not corrupted which is really almost I'm sorry but it's almost laughable because our congress yeah. was recently dissolved because of how much corruption there was. So that on, on, on one hand is great because now Air Rights International has overwhelming proof to show that is not the case. Unfortunately, the Peruvian government are, there is a lot of corruption still happening. There is now a new Congress. 
yeah, you know, there are signs that we're going to go on a better direction, but by no means, um, you know, was enough corrupted before. So the lawyers have uh, uh, now appealed again. So we are hopeful that the, the judge in Pennsylvania will consider this new evidence. But again, this is everybody expects this to be, to, you know, to take time. I, I noticed that um, in, on October 1st, like, President Trump signed a, a bill uh, or a proclamation in the United States about uh, changing oversight on mining and corporate operations that people might want to pay attention to. I was looking for the the sort the citation for that, but I can't find it right now. Um, and how is Maxima herself doing? They they are doing uh, well enough considering the pandemic. Obviously, what what I mean on one hand, because she's always her and her family have always lived off the land. The pandemic didn't yeah. affect them on that end. Like they already had access to you know clean water, and they are used to growing their their land and their farm animals. So they they've been sustainable in that way all the time. What has been challenging is, of course, that the, the mining companies is still not allowing them to um, use half of their land, basically. So they, they will destroy the crops. They'll sometimes still walk in and kill animals. So um, now they, they already had to leave their land and go purchase you know, food. So now that's what the pandemic has made harder because now they have to travel longer pay more for transportation but <clears throat> luckily because um you, you probably have seen it on our website but we we created a GoFundMe campaign for maxima and her family to cover for her living and living expenses and they she has been she's had had wonderful support there so those funds are allowing her to pay for those additional costs okay. during the pandemic and what what the website is yes uh so yes, our is uh, standwithmaxima.com. So anybody interested can go and find ways uh, in which they can support the cause, support Maxima, share the film also uh, with their communities if they're interested. Um, and, and, you know, just learn more about her case and her fight, which are, I think, really worth it um, looking into. <clears throat> well, we've reached kind of the end of this. Is there anything additional that you want to let people know of that we weren't able to cover? before we go? <laughs> um, I, I just would like to, first of all, thank everybody for, for their support. It's been beautiful that even during these hard times and with everything happening around the world that um, everybody still cares about you know environmental issues, human rights issues. That, that to me has been the, the most beautiful thing, inspiring thing to, and, and hopeful thing to, to witness these past few months. Um, and you know, I think, I, I just would like to, remind everybody that these are issues that really affect all of us sometimes because you know maxima's case is, is in peru seems far away it seems like oh yeah that that is not really it, it, sometimes it's like that is tragic but you don't think that it actually affects you it really does you know ultimately these resources we all need these resources to survive and they're you know quickly um being destroyed so hopefully it's, it's ultimately in our hands as individuals to do something even small things make a huge difference. So hopefully Maxima's story inspires all of us to do something. Well, thank you for being with us, Claudia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we'll watch for your next project also. Uh, <laughs> yeah. this, this interview will be on the Film Fest DC website, um, hopefully very soon. And when the festival is over, it will also be up on the festival's YouTube channel. So if you want to refer anybody to that, thank you for the audience for watching and uh, see you at the movies. Thank you. Thank you.